And we are back with another awesome panel here as part of Sinister CyberCon. Uh, we thank you guys. Again, happy Mother's Day, wherever you are, whoever you are. All you moms out there, happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, double, triple, quadruple, because you're spending it watching some of the cool panels and artist demonstrations we have coming up. And right now we have a super cool conversation. Very much looking forward to having our guest. She founded one of the coolest production companies that I found as a fan and watched all her films, uh, Lucha Gore Productions. Um, you professional wrestling fans may recognize that last name, and it's kind of a cool pun on that company uh, when I introduce her. But uh, Gigi Sol Guerrero is our guest right now. And the uh, the great uh, the Lucha Gore name, like I told you when I first like Facebook met you, uh, was very apropos to the uh, the Guerrero name. So it was like the best of both worlds. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> Luchadors and horror films. You gotta love it. Right. That's like the best combination. It's like <laughs> and tacos. Like you can't go wrong. Like you just yeah. can't go wrong. <laughs> um. I mean, that company, man, I know um, going back to like the Crip TV days when they did their their ambassador program and all these brands were kind of like going in. I think you and I first crossed paths because we were both like the ambassadors, Horrific Network and Lucha Gore. And yeah. so it was kind of like you were exiting film schools. I was thinking about entering and you were very you know, encouraging and you were like, here is my film um you know that i'm working <laughs> on and you sent me some promotional stuff for el gigante and and i was like oh my god like this is Woo, that this was is, some time ago that's all yeah. awesome. i'm glad you remember that <laughs> but that i mean the vibe of that that's like independent pro wrestling meets texas chainsaw massacre yes you said like, it perfectly <laughs> <laughs> like that is without question um like you can uh, totally get what you are going for with that one. The second that, but then you got like this other film at the front because he falls off of the fence and everything. So there's like that super serious tone there mm -hmm. with our, our hero, for lack of a better term. If you take El Gigante himself out of the hero equation. Yeah. Um, so you hit, it's almost like a, uh, culture shock thing to come kind of the tone that starts the uh the uh el gigante sh short there and then you when you take the right turn into to horror you take it very hard right away i feel like you you, you might as well film it and if it's too much you can always take it out and post because i think <laughs> i think uh, a horror filmmaker's actual nightmare would be that you just don't have enough of the horror i think oh, like yeah. that would be the worst. So why not go balls to the walls crazy from the start, for sure? That is, uh, that's kind of cool to hear you say, because the both with that too, like you go balls to the walls. <laughs> uh, like you do it. Um, I think it's all those years as a kid, I was just not allowed anywhere near anything scary or anything. And yeah. even that, you know, I'm from Mexico City and even our newspaper, like, the front page can be something really nasty, really intense. Like you see people without their head, like right on the front cover of the newspaper there. Right. And I would always grow up in, you know, that environment curious because my mom would always cover my eyes. She'd always be like, don't look at that. Don't look at that for yeah. everything. So I feel like El Gigante was everything that I just wasn't allowed near it. Near it. And right. the only thing I could see as a kid was, uh, plastic surgeries on TV always after school, five o'clock, right before my favorite cartoon, <laughs> it was plastic surgeries, and I'd be like, Whoa, like, what is that? Um, yeah, good times, dark times, good times for sure. Um, <laughs> that yeah. like this, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, it, it's no, I'm, I'm just thinking the plastic surgery thing comes into your makeup that you guys did on the uh the the masks when you have the burlap 
like sewn into his freaking skin, <laughs> like hostile saw style, like as brutal stuff. Cool. Yeah, when he's pulling the mask. Yes. Oh, so yeah. cool. So cool. Well, you know, the it's based on a book. So what you saw was uh, chapter one of the book we read, which is uh, called Muerte con Carne, which means death with meat, uh, by Shane McKenzie. And when we read it, we were like, this is insane. Like, this is the Mexican leather face. And yeah. we clearly just filmed the opening sequence. It's like the opening to a feature. Right, right, right. And, and so, I mean, all we did was just, just add a little more more story to that first character that's crossing the border. So we gave him a family just so, you know, make it a little more cruel. And Well, God knows you guys could totally do like the horror uh -huh. version of like ready to rumble the freaking, the, the early two thousands. Was it the WCW David R. Kent movie? That's right. Like you got like triple a down there. I don't know what other wrestling promotions. Triple a is the one that comes on TV mm -hmm. where we are. So I know those guys, but I don't know. I can only assume there'd be multiple wrestling promotions that would jump on the chance to make the horror Texas Chainsaw version of Ready to Rumble in I Mexico City. That's such a good. I, I don't. I don't know why we didn't think about that. Thank you. Ten percent <laughs> to you, man. <laughs> We're on. That's awesome. <laughs> um, like how in the hell is that for a tagline? Um, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Ready to rumble wrestling. I like it. But your journey, man, as a filmmaker, when when the Into the Darkness thing happened, when Hulu came up with this concept, I know multiple people who were trying to like break in and have careers in the industry, whether they be gaffers or lighters, writers, directors. The fact that Hulu, because streaming is so in right now, was investing heavily on like a uh, a series um, that every month a new crew, new filmmaker cast was going to make like a horror movie mm -hmm. that had a relationship to the month, some looser than others, some directly related to the month, um, was pretty rad. Because that, I mean, that's huge for people that are breaking out opportunity-wise. Yeah, and I mean, streaming platforms, as you say, is what's new. There's such a high demand for content. And mm -hmm. you know, it's just, you know, widen the opportunities for indie filmmakers like myself. Uh, mm -hmm. And also, what I love about streaming is that the rules are not as intense as theatrical. You know, I feel right. that you can get away with so much more on those platforms that things are just more risky. Uh, even for example, let's take Shudder. What a great place to show very niche films. Uh, and I'm just so glad that Netflix, Hulu, and all those platforms are doing the same. Cause you you really still, we still suffer from very risky horror out in the theaters. I find that we still can sometimes go a little bit further and we don't see it as often. I think the Evil Dead remake, Hereditary did go there, but we don't see it enough. And streaming platforms do do that, and it's and it's awesome. It's great for us. It's great for us to get that chance to make a feature. Yeah, the um, the month. Like, it's interesting how how kind of like you know twenty twenty the memes and everything on social media and to to not be a twenty twenty troll where it's like. <laughs> 2020 is really kicking us while we were down, but the uh, the the climate that we were in when culture shock happened mm -hmm. was so like a year ago to think where we were. What what like the top five concerns were a year ago to now is kind of kind of crazy as far as the mass mindset of people, um, and the, the sensitivity of the topic of culture shock was so like you were drawing from current, current culture, current times. Yeah. But then like to take the, the El Gigante turn that the right whole, the horror turn, we find out about the lab and we find out, find out about the computer simulation. And, you know, you'd kind of, I don't know if you meant to, to call, kind of like a little Easter egg or not, but the computer simulation 
America Town, the American yeah, village that she is so in. Um, she uh, wakes up in a town that reminded me of Tim Burton's Beetlejuice. Yes. That was okay. my references. Okay. You're the oh. man, dude. You're the man. <laughs> you give me a 10% the time. Okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Very much uh, that town and um, Stepford Wife kind of feel. Yes. Uh, um, but yeah, 100%. I remember being in that meeting being like, is there a town that looks like the Edward Scissorhands town here? Anybody know of a town? Yeah. Like that? Um, but you know what? It was... When I first read that script, it did hit me very hard, especially as a Mexican and what, what was going on, especially at that time with the border crisis. I was like, I gotta tell this story. Like I really have to do this. It felt like almost like a responsibility in a way. Cause you know, as a filmmaker, you, you gotta love what you're telling or else you're gonna have a really hard time. And yeah. it felt like that culture shock was quite a different turn from El Gigante and all those Lucha Gore, Grindhouse, gritty, crazy shorts that we've done. Right. So I thought it was also an opportunity to show a different side of me, to to show more serious side that um, I, th I think it was important to tell that. And I'm just so glad that Blumhouse and Hulu let me take, you know, a crack at the script to just give it that, that authenticity and that, that heart that I think for us Latinos was important to see on screen. And I, I'm just so, so happy for the trust and what a great cast and crew for sure. The way that you guys marketed that film too mm -hmm. was pretty brilliant because you had, you know, the first thing that we got, we got stills and we got the picture in front of the American flag. Um, and we're like, so Gigi's MO, I remember talking to this about with the guys from Horror by Proxy, where like her her MO is like these these like crazy horror films, like El Gigante pulling out your intestine crazy horror films. Oh, yeah. And then <laughs> we're like, so what is like we're all kind of like looking at the the stills and stuff. And we're like, what is the end game? The town looks like Beetlejuice, like Stepford Wives. Because you got them all, you know, polo, you know, tight, tight uh, hair, all the whole whole nine, and um, so we got like the subtext. But I was like, holy, like, what is the turn going to be? And then the turn, you getting Sean, who is the like the the under underappreciated, overworked scientist that decides to have the change in heart as to what exactly the study is. And you put this whole like hostile saw esque stage design oh, together. Like, I, was, I was hungry for gore or some yeah. horror, man. That was a lot of days in a pretty town with no blood. It was the first <laughs> time I was like, there is no blood on this set. Like, I was going mental. I was like, this is so different for me. What do I do? Like, it was <laughs> going crazy. And, you know, when, when I would read the script, that, that lab, like, where Sean. Ashmore, uh, his character, and Creed. Ah, oh, I love Creed. So yeah. where they worked, when you read it on the script, it didn't quite have uh, much description as to maybe what it looked like. Possibly it felt like an old Twilight zone feel, techie, you know, encounters of the third kind kind of kind of vibe. Right. And I was like, no, man, we gotta we gotta really feel like these people are you know slaves and 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 we got to make them feel like they are just so um forced into a yeah. culture because that's exactly um, what i see on the news i just felt what i was looking at uh, on at the news was so ugly and yeah. it was like caging animals and i was like oh we're doing that <laughs> everybody yeah. was like i think that's a little too much i'm like oh no no we're doing that like yeah. that's got to be it's going to be disgusting and yeah. Uh, that was the time that I was like, well, there's not much gore in this movie. So that whole reveal has got to look insane. So, uh, you know, the references there were definitely The Matrix. I was a big fan of that. And uh, I don't know if you've seen uh, new J.J. Abrams. He produced it, but Overlord. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'd like, I was like, okay, 
Mix those two, and it, this baby will will happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the uh, and you know you do you mentioned there is there's not an over use of gore in this. Um, it is a whole lot more psychological as far as like the whole this is actually happening, but then you have the psychological what is happening once we've turned and the first uh, instance of character design where we we see that is you get uh, to work with Barbara Crampton. Oh, she's awesome. She's and, so cool. And, I mean, she she's gets so cool. to be like your kind of like your what the hell is going on here character. Definitely. Yeah, she, she had a blast with that character. And you know what? Uh, a fun story, her character, Betty, that was the hardest character to cast. We yeah. just could not, we could not find the right person. It, it just, and we were very close to shooting. I was like, oh my God, what are we going to do? And yeah. then it just popped to my head. I'm like, wait a second. I have Barbara Crampton's phone number. We don't <laughs> talk, but I have her number from Mexico because we met at a film festival like a few months before uh, um, in Mexico. Morbido, it's called. Yeah. And I was like, she's a little young and a little hot for the part, but I think she could do this. And, and so I, I called her and uh, I said, hey girl, what's up? I know we don't talk, but you know, I got this thing. And you know, long story short, she she loved it. And yeah. um, and at first, you know, we weren't going, we couldn't cast her because I didn't know that she didn't live in LA. And so we thought that was gonna be, because it's a low budget film. Right, right. So, damn, like that was the opportunity because her self tape audition in her living room was perfect. Ah, yeah. oh, we can't afford her. Until that day, I think it was that day or the next day, just the gods were with me that uh, Hulu sent an email being like, hey everybody, if you consider great horror cameos for the following Into the Dark films, here's a list of actors we think are cool. Guess who was number two? Her. Nice. I was like, <laughs> get her. Get, get get her. And so that that's what did it. And it was like just the stars aligned so perfectly. And she's she's so talented and so wonderful to have. Um Barbara, she really brought so much to that character, and she really understood exactly what I was looking for. And it was something I just couldn't find in the audition room with others. And she really just had this, because like you say, there's not it, there's not gore in this movie or anything like that. It's all psychological. So she really had to find these, these layers of creepiness that were subtle and that could really give a vibe that I'm in the wrong house. I'm in the wrong place. And she she played that awesome. She's great. Yeah. Right on. <laughs> um, with this, you know, everybody always says um, when they make a movie, don't don't necessarily plan for a franchise or a a uh, run of any any uh, length of time because you are lucky in the fact that you got to make the first one. But the the world, you know, these the characters, they're they are worth rooting for. They are, uh, you know, they're they're characters that if we saw this story, that especially you know, you have the the key elements. You have the the lovable hero versus whatever the hell the corporation, the U.S. Will there be just a U.S. government, just Trump machine kind of just dick kind of a, of a. Exactly bad guy or is it a uh you know just something more twisted like umbrella corp in the resident evil we don't know yet but we would watch another one to try, try to find out would you ever uh, return to this world i i definitely would i think there's so much to be told in in, in just that um social commentary i mm -hmm. think i think it'd be extremely worth it but i think it could be taken in different cultures of the world. Like it, it, I think that same idea can definitely happen anywhere. It's something that happens everywhere. Uh, so I would love to. I, I'm really happy with just this one story. Yeah. I think it said what it needed to say, but 
I never thought about it until you asked. See, man, 10% again. What's going on? <laughs> what is happening here? I'm I, telling you. I think that's, that'd be really interesting. Really, yeah. really interesting. Yeah. I, I dig the idea of multiple uh, walks of life having that same, that coexisting boundary problem. Be yeah. nice. Hashtag be nice out of all of it. Okay. We have some we have some questions. Um, Ashley said, how did you acquire the nickname? I'm going to let you pronounce that, Juju. La Muñeca del Terror. You, you, you oh, always oh. got to say it very sexy when you talk in Spanish. You got to <laughs> always say it like you're Salma Hayek or else it's not going to work. <laughs> I'll just do the white nerd version. The okay. doll of terror. I like it too. <laughs> <laughs> uh so yeah. how did you get that name bestowed upon you? That's such a great, it's a great question. I asked myself the same thing, but sometime maybe like four years ago or so, in one of the festivals in Mexico, it just kind of became a hashtag and it became a thing. And I don't know who started it or anything, but one day just uh, on Instagram, it was Instagram or, or Twitter, I just kept seeing La Muñeca del Terror hashtag, and it was my picture. And I was like, I think somebody confusing me with like Chucky's bride or something. <laughs> and and sure enough, no, it just became a thing for me. And, and it was so cool that it was in Mexico that this started. Mm -hmm. And now to get recognized with that that nickname it, from there, it's awesome. So I was like, okay, I'm keeping it. I'm definitely keeping it and, and let's keep going. Sometimes you just have to, you know, take that brand and just make it your own. So yeah. definitely big thanks to to those wonderful people in Mexico that started it. I think it was at the festival of Macabro in Mexico City. Yeah. You know, speaking of doing, you know, doing that, you getting that name, uh, a lot of you know, filmmaking filmmakers internationally they love to draw mm -hmm. on their international heritage and it seems like you know the true horror fans they all really dig a horror movie from another culture you know mm -hmm. whether it be a, a mexican horror film japanese or you know film european horror film it's interesting to find out what these cultures are all kind of what stories they're telling what they think is scary mm -hmm. Is there like a, you know, here, um, you know, La Llorona has been done. Um, uh, the one the other year we loved, we thought it was a perfect ghost story, the way that they have told her tale. Um, there are other versions of it, international versions of that story that are better, but that is a good ghost story. Um, well, that's what makes it so cool. I think for filmmakers to tap into their own culture, it's just so rich and no one else is going to understand it better than yourself. Like this is what our own grandparents would. And I'm going to use this word like this is what my grandma would threaten me with. Like she was like always scaring me in the craziest ways with these legends. But growing up with that fear, you're only going to be the perfect storyteller to tell those stories. So I think it's really important, you know, as a filmmaker, just go to your roots as much as you can. I can't wait to do uh, something with the folklore uh, uh, from Mexico. Uh, we've been working on Santa Muerte. Actually, I have it right here. Ha, I have it right here. So the Santa Muerte uh, mythology is super, super interesting. It's one of the most uh, amazing religions in Mexico. It's the Lady of Holy Death. And that's something that, you know, I'm so excited to be working on that script right now. Um, but it's the scariest stuff. Like, so you got to watch out to not open anything, any portals or anything on set, because I believe something's going to go go down. <laughs> be so careful. Yeah. Are you one? Is that, what is it that uh, gets to you the most? As my, I'm not a director, but as a horror fan, like, what's the scariest thing? Man, for me is I'm terrified of just uh, the corruption of the church and demons, exorcisms. I think it's all real. I believe yeah. all. Um, 
it scares me to death. Well, you know, in Mexico, we're very spiritual people. Same with many parts of the world. So, yeah. uh, you know, I every time I see a movie with that, I am terrified. The Exorcist, The Omen, like even newer ones, Conjuring and all those. I'm like, no, oh, that all happened. Like, that's me. <laughs> I believe all of it, all of it, all of it. And especially with my mom and my grandma who are super superstitious to everything. Everything is the devil in this house. Uh, yeah. So I, I, that's the stuff that really gets me, man. Like, it terrifies me. It absolutely terrifies me. <laughs> yeah. Uh with uh, your culture, some of the, the stories that have been uh, called upon have definitely left themselves to be part of uh, the Into the Dark series again. And I know, I mean, we got uh, Puka 2 as season two of Into the Darkness. Are we going to get a uh, another into the dark film, whether it be culture shock two or something else completely out of you. I, I hope so. We definitely Blumhouse and I, we have some plans. I can't tell you yet. I can't tell you yet, but definitely some really cool stuff's on the way. Uh, as soon as we get, you know, out of this, uh, little thing that 2020 seems to be going through, we yeah, have some sure. cool plans. Like I am so excited. Culture shock really opened up a lot of doors and, uh, I, I'm gonna go way more on the gore, whatever I try <laughs> to do next. I I can't feel that anymore. People just yeah. uh, heads just gotta explode. Like something's gonna happen. <laughs> so yeah, plans uh, are coming. Plans are coming. Jay is wondering, were there particular films that you when you watched them, you knew like, yes, I want to make a filmmaker? Man. Ah, definitely. I mean, I didn't know I wanted to be a filmmaker that, until I was 16. I, I always get so surprised by this story because it's not a horror film. But I saw when I was 16 years old, Children of Men. Mm. And I've never seen anything like that. Nothing. Like, I just was a horror fan younger. And I loved comedies and all this uh, when I was growing up. But no movie punched me in the face like that movie did. Yeah. And I, I still remember that day my sister was on a date with this guy who was going to film school. And I was, you know, 16 and, and I was a brat. And I told my mom, Mom, I don't want to stay home by myself. Can I go with my sister uh, to her date? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a nice idea. Yes, you should go with your sister. <laughs> And I was like, ha, ha, ha. Like, I just wanted to be in the way. And yeah. that was the movie they went to see. And what a movie. It's not for everybody, but, man. It, I mean, like, Culture Shock, it just had a lot to say. And yeah. I was kind of immature at that age. I didn't take stuff seriously. I enjoyed horror and all that. But I think I didn't enjoy movies for the right reasons. And that was the first movie that just really told me a lot about how humanity needs a lot of work and and uh and those shots like th those wonners are out of this planet and mm -hmm. and that uh boyfriend at the time of hers he said to me oh that's what i'm studying in school to be a filmmaker like that and i was like oh, there's such a thing as a school that teaches films like you can make shots like that he's like yeah they're teaching us all of that and i was like oh. i went home that night and i was like mom i'm going to film school mm. and since that moment because that was a mexican director cuaron i looked into del toro i didn't know about him uh, at that age I, I looked at all his films and i started watching pants labyrinth then i looked into Robert Rodriguez, Mexican-American. I was like, oh my God, this guy's amazing. I started watching Dust Till Dawn and then led me to Tarantino and all this stuff. And I was like, ah, oh, there's a whole world of awesomeness. And it was thanks to that experience for sure. Yeah, I, that, I got too excited, I'm sorry. No, you're fine. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it's true though, because there is you know, more, we talked about it yesterday with, with Harrison Smith. There's more 
sub areas, sub genres in horror to go down more so than any other genre. Um, Tarantino and Rodriguez, those are sub genres within just the name is a sub genre. Yeah. Um, they're awesome. Like, I'm so glad I started watching Rodriguez films and Tarantino right at the beginning of film school. And I was like, these guys like cross the line, like, they, yeah. they go for it. And I, I was so into it, so into it. If they're, um, their capability of bending genre is cool too. Like he, you know, they both like will tell a tell a story. It's like we'll jump through enough hoops. If we want to try to jump through hoops, we'll jump through hoops. But we're gonna give you the middle finger as we <laughs> jump through the hoop the whole time. Exactly. So. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, no. I mean, that was the time where my parents were like, "She's starting to watch really weird stuff." Like they were very, yeah. <laughs> I, I wouldn't tell them I was watching at my younger age. I wouldn't tell them a lot of the movies I would watch. Like I would keep away from them, like the faculty and, yeah. uh, you know, uh, 13 ghosts and stuff. When I was a young yeah. teenager, I just wouldn't tell them I was watching them. And once I started going to film school and seeing all like actual horror and like genre right. films, I, I wasn't going to hide it anymore. And they were like, yeah. Por qué, mija? why are you going to do that? Are you going to do stuff like that? Well, I'm thinking about it. No, no, please, please, you, please, Jesus, no. Like, <laughs> they really wanted to stop me. Uh, and so that's kind of when I would take my dad to the theater. And uh, I, I'll never forget, I took him to see Inglorious Bastards. And, uh, and that was the first, it's sad to say, because that's one of his, later films but that was the first tarantino experience we had as with with my dad as father daughter was in glorious yeah. and it was since then that he's like oh this is really good this mm -hmm. is really good like i said see i told you that like let me show you the ways of the dark side <laughs> that finally worked it, it took time but it worked <laughs> it is one of those things too is like you can jump in. There's so many different ways to make it try to uh, appeal to uh, get on one side. Maybe you don't like a, a slasher, but you dig zombies, or maybe you don't like whatever. Yeah. And it's gonna, like, I'm not the biggest zombie fan. Like, I like them, but look at Train to Busan. That's the first zombie movie that I saw with my family that they sat through the whole thing, like, loving it. And it, there's there's a fine balance in horror that you could just make such rich and relatable characters that you won't forget you're watching a horror. So I think we live in such a great time right now that horror is being recognized in a more, almost like being more appreciated by different uh, communities, different people. We're starting to appreciate subtitles in films. It took this long. But we're challenging audiences now to check out horror. That horror is as recognizable as a drama or an Oscar-winning movie. It's it's another art form. Uh, so we we just have to keep encouraging people to to watch it, and we got to challenge them with good stories. Uh, I think that's the way to go. Um, we got a question. Your current I know you just announced them too. Uh, what is your current VO work? And when will it be made available for everybody? My current one? Well, I can't quite say. I hate that I can't say stuff, man. Um, but I booked a video game, which is really cool. Uh, a big one. for. Uh, I'll give a hint. It's a, a video game company in Montreal. That's all I can say. I'm sure that will tell you everything, uh, which one. But... That I'm super excited about, and uh, and uh, I mean, if you want to see more of my VO work, definitely go to Netflix and check out Super Monsters. If you have kids, this is perfect for them. Uh, season two and three, season four is coming, so definitely more of my character is coming. And uh, and I think Disney Plus now has the Marvel superhero adventures, and I play Spider Girl, so that you can check it out there. Um, but there's more stuff. I just can't say it. I can't say it just yet. But it's gonna be really cool. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Charlie says critics have called Culture Shock uh, one of the best. Um, how was it reacting to that? And Brian kind of has a comment that uh, piggybacks onto that comment is your cast obviously is a huge factor uh, uh, in going forward in any production and the success. The great cast is what your your moviegoer remembers the most, I would think. And uh, Brian's asking about Richard uh, Cabral, whose, whose story of success is impressive in itself. Was there any influence from your Mexicano dominant cast on how you approached uh, the film? What did they were they giving you ideas of the different stuff, trying to cross the border, all that stuff? Yeah, I mean, definitely combining both those questions and comments, it was for me really important to be as authentic as possible. Uh, through the auditioning process, I I made it so clear that this needed to be. A Mexican cast, like I, I said, these guys are going to fully understand what I'm talking about. Unless, sure, we find someone who's Hispanic and speak Spanish, no problem. I'm open to it. But I just felt in my gut that somebody with with a story to tell, like myself, moving from Mexico here to Canada, we're really going to understand it. And yeah. I mean, taking Richard Cabral for example. He didn't audition. He had a meeting with me and all we did was talk. All we did was talk. And he's, you know, Mexican American. His parents immigrated to Mexico and, and his story is mind blowing. Definitely, I recommend anybody watching and listening to this uh, read up on R Richard Cabral's just life story is so inspiring. Um, uh, and him and I just talked. We didn't even really talk much about the script. We just talked about how it is for us, you know, how it is for us changing cultures, wanting to fit in. And it just felt he was the right guy. And also for his character, Santo, who's my favorite. Oh, my God. He's my favorite. He he loved the rewrites uh, that El Santo was just not. He wasn't your stereotype criminal with tattoos and kills people. No, no he had a story as well. He had a reason to cross the border as well. People just sometimes judge, you know, right away and don't know everybody's actual story of what they're going through and what their situation is. Uh, you know, the lead actress, Marta Igareda, same thing. We, she didn't audition. We just had a talk about the script and how important it was. And she was just, in love with this idea and she had just recently moved to the u.s and uh and she really understood a hundred percent why this had to be told and she would even wear the fake pregnant belly on her own just to start practicing what it'd be like and and the struggle you know um i think you know critics really are appreciating culture shock for its authenticity because that really was the goal and the trust from both studios to to not you know not lie about anything i really yeah. didn't want to uh sugarcoat shit like i was like mm -hmm. okay so when i first read the script i was like all right i see what it's trying to say but might as well say it might as well shove this in people's face and and make a point uh, you know, and I think uh, thanks to that cast and even the non-Hispanic cast like Creed and Sean Ashmore, they were like so on it and so invested in, in just telling a story from a different perspective. And Sean's character to me was a tricky one because we didn't want the white savior. You know, we didn't, we, but we wanted a guy who also has a story and a reason to be there who also we need to understand his point of view as well and sympathize for him. And I think Sean really brought that. All of them together was so perfect, so spot on. It's exciting. It's really exciting to see. I think, it, I think it, it's you that really brings it, though, because oh, thank you. I think the biggest thing, and I've had this conversation um, with multiple people, film, people who love film, horror, everything, and I think people who are genuinely now a fan of something first are going to create something with, a, with more of a message. Yeah. You, 
yeah. are a horror fan. You. You, were a, you were a horror fan who <laughs> got to become a filmmaker. But with that, you know, you kind of know how it feels when something is manufactured yeah. and, and it's out there and we're watching something that they, they're trying to throw a ball through a hoop and make mm. some money on it. And then we know how we feel when we watch something that is like, there is a message, whether it be uh, pertaining to the current state of things or not, there's a message in there that is meant for us to kind of like get and be like, it's more than just a dude with a knife stabbing somebody. There's, mm -hmm. there's something that the filmmaker is trying to say with it. And so, and so those, I feel, I feel like those kind of horror films come from horror fans. Yeah. More than someone who's just kind of like delving into the genre or whatever. Yeah. And, and you have to almost be scared while filming this. Honey, please. I was terrified while filming <laughs> this. I was like, well, I don't know how people are going to react because A, I'm not American. So I I don't, don't know much about Fourth of July. I mean, a little bit, sure. Mm -hmm. But I, I also I'm I'm saying some some pretty heavy stuff with what's going on over there. So yeah. I was, who please somebody hold hold on to your butts, right? <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, and and you know it was just you got to stay calm while filming this. You got to be like, you're doing this for the right reasons. Everybody's here because they trust you, and I I do have to say I was really surprised that the critics were loving it so much. And I mean, it's still 100% on Rotten Tomatoes, but man, I got a lot of attacks from Trump supporters. And oh, yeah. it was, I, I, I kind of was loving it on Twitter. I was like, <laughs> I, was a, I was a troll back with a lot. Mm -hmm. and, but, but like, you know, I remember my manager was like, Gigi, you should probably not, not respond. I'm like, okay. And I was like, oh. but, but, but you, you know, so I, I just kind of had to accept it that you're yeah. not going to please anybody, no matter what you're, what movie you're making. And For sure. you have to remember that and not be so hard on yourself. Cause I think this is a very uh, tough industry. It's yeah. Really tough. And you just kind of have to love what you made and, and make the next one better for yourself and for the people that, are enjoying it um right. for sure <laughs> is there a um man i'm thinking in my mind one thing that i always like to do is uh we talk about it on our podcast channel all the time is we go to these haunted houses so i don't know if you do yeah. any haunted houses come halloween time of course of course i actually i don't I, some people know but i actually uh i'm part of Friday nights here in uh, okay. Vancouver, and I've helped uh, make some of the houses. I named one of the houses, which I'm super proud of, and helped design some of them. It's it's been a it's like a side hobby, uh, being a supervisor at Friday nights. I love it so much. Um, so I love haunted houses, man. Whoo, it's a good time. If you were gonna, if you were going to uh, design one. Based upon, I mean, you could do a pretty twisted one based on culture shock, honestly. But really? if you were going to design one, uh, a haunted house based on something you have done, oh, so oh, what oh. would you what would you want to see in a haunted house? I'm gonna have to go with El Gigante, dude. Can you imagine like a wrestling, gritty, disgusting haunted house, and you just see the guy like Whoa, coming to wrestle? Oh no, I can't. That'd be yeah. sick. That'd be I mean, if I, if I had to choose also, I mean, I don't know if a lot of people know the a couple of Mexican legends. I'm a big fan of El Coco or El Cucuy, which is Mexicans, uh, Mexico's boogeyman or yep, yeah. Latin America's yeah. boogeyman. Uh, yeah. eats, eats children. I love it. It's, it's <laughs> yeah, my grandma would sing me that lullaby when I was a bad kid. Um, meaning since yesterday, because I've always been a bad kid. But, uh, and also the trolls in Mexico are called alushes, and those are really creepy. So I recommend anybody listening, look that up, alushes. They're yeah, we went, terrifying trolls. <laughs> we went to a haunted house at Universal Studios. Oh, they're awesome. And, and Danny Trejo voiced El Cucoy. Really? 
Yes. How, how many years ago was that? That, gosh, like six-ish, oh. somewhere around there. Damn, I missed it. Oh, that's yeah, gotta, so cool. Yeah. You gotta YouTube it. You can hear Danny Trejo read the read the uh, nursery rhyme or. The... Um, oh my god! Okay, I went to I went to uh, Horror Nights. It's called right over there. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, I went there a couple of years ago for the first time, and I was just like, it's just it's so good. Like the, the production design, oh, it was amazing. It was amazing. Funny enough, I mean, I didn't expect this, but the the haunted house that scared me the most was the the one that I least expected to be scared was the Michael Myers, the Halloween house. I was like, oh, I, I don't know what he looks like. I know, and it was the same guy with that white mask every corner. And I was like, I'm not gonna get scared. This has happened three times, and it just kept happening fifty more times, and he <laughs> kept getting me. Um, yeah. Haunted houses are the best. I love them. Um. Anyway, we are sadly out of time. No, um, yeah. I have a good time. <laughs> but Gigi, where can everybody like keep tabs? See what you got coming out next. For sure. No, definitely follow me. You know, on Twitter, Instagram. Definitely not TikTok. I am really bad at it. Do not <laughs> watch those videos. Um. But it's the same handle at Horror Guerrero. Uh, and I'm going to be posting a lot of cool stuff. There's a lot of voiceover coming up, more film. Uh, I, I got a lot of surprises, guys. So definitely follow me uh, and Lucha Gore, and you'll be you'll be happy with what's next. Very cool. Thank you very much. And happy <clears throat> we will be back uh, momentarily with an artist demonstration. Thank you guys for watching.